Welcome everyone to the newest series on my channel that I'm going to label The Deltarune Files. Undertale has been getting a bit of a resurgence lately with Undertale Yellow the fan game coming out and a couple of playthroughs I've been seeing people try out so I've been like, huh, you know what, I want to discuss about this game again. And the 9th anniversary is this year so might as well start analyzing all that. And the Toby Fox can do, you know, Deltarune for like the 6th anniversary. I'm able to do Deltarune for the 9th anniversary, am I right? So how this series is going to work is that each episode I do is going to be focused on one specific topic or character. So maybe one day it's the bunker, maybe one day it's Rousey. It's going to be on that specific subject. And by the end of the series, I'm going to put everything onto a whiteboard and sort of connect everything together and say what my big, massive, all the chapters of Deltarune theory is going to be. So with that out of the way, let's start off this first episode. Chris. Chris Dreamer. Or that should be their last name, I don't know, um, divorce issues. You are not the father! Chris Dreamer is the character that we... Mm, I'm not gonna say play as, you'll see why later, but... The character that we control in Deltarune Chapter 1 and 2. Chris is very mysterious in that there are many things that we know about Chris, but there are also many things that we don't know about Chris. There are confirmed facts in Deltarune though that we can for sure say is true about Chris. These facts goes as follows. <gasps> Chris is the child of Toyo and Asgore, adopted because obvious, and the sibling of Asriel. They're the only human in hometown and possibly have never seen any other humans, assuming Chris's reaction to closing the library book is because they felt weird about looking at other humans. Chris feels out of place in their family, seeing as they had a pair of red horns so that they could fit in. Chris quote unquote knows how to play the piano. Chris studied the occult with Caddy. Them, Des, Noel, and Asriel used to hang out all the time together. They love chocolate, Chocol they have their own personal knife, and they love to pull pranks, specifically on Noel and the Holiday family. They actually have red eyes naturally it seems. And most importantly of all, they love moss. Oh, and also they've been acting strange lately, but we're more focused on the moss aspect. Phew. Well, with that out of the way, on initial thought, you might think Chris is some sort of like weird combination of Frisk and Kara from Undertale, with Chris having the whole gameplay and save aspect of Frisk and the personality of Kara, which also ties into the looks if you really think about it, because like you know the the like, skin tone of Frisk with the like um, outfit and colors of Kara. Personally though, I want to ignore all that. Now I'm not saying that people can like say, oh, they look so sort of similar and everything, and they can't say I, like, you know, it reminds them of like Frisk and Kara, but I feel like looking at that is going against what Toby's wishes of um, Deltarune are. Toby wants people to see this not as like Undertale 2, they want to, he wants them to see it as Deltarune, as its own thing. So Chris literally being a combination of Frisk and Kara wouldn't work in that in a sense. Chris is not some combination of Frisk and Kara. They have similarities, sure, but that is not what Chris is. Chris is their own person. Now let's continue to the not so much more speculative parts, but more so the parts that we're like, I don't know, like 90% sure. Case in point, the fact that we're controlling Chris. Unlike Undertale, where it was like pretty vague on who controls whom, or like who the narrator is and all that stuff. Personally, I really like the narrow car theory. In Deltarune, it's basically spelled out multiple times to us that Chris is their own person. For starters, they've had their entire life um, basically lived at be, uh, up to the point of chapter 1. We know of their like, like past actions and backstories because people around town have memories of Chris doing other things. And they also been pointing out how Chris has been acting very strange. And while on the subject of that, ever since we took control of Chris, there have been some things that have been obviously off. For example, 
not being able to play the piano correctly. We know that Chris played the piano, and according to the um, hospital nurse, that uh, Chris was very well at the piano, and she even asked if Chris was sick because of it. Chris talking to Sans like they previously met, even though he and Papyrus just moved in. Mentioning Alfie's to Undyne and vice versa, and seems to have forgotten information that they should know already. Case in point, Chris is acting very weird, and if you're a massive Deltrun fan, or even a standard one, you probably already know where this is going. But like, long story short, we're controlling Chris's soul. That's why there's even info that we know about from Undertale that Chris will have no idea about. For example, the bake sale um, save location. In Deltrune, there is no bake sale previously to that save, yet it says it talks about like a reminiscing bake sale. And the only other time there was a bake sale was in Undertale. Heck, even the biggest piece of evidence in these in this game is from the first save point you go to, where you go to it, you press it, and it says Chris's save file, and then you literally just overwrite on uh, Chris's save. Heck, I'll even get to them in a future video because this one's focusing just on Chris right now, but both Jevil and especially Spamton hint at this, to the point of confirming it outright basically. So, on that subject of the soul, the game begins with us being teleported into this sort of like room, this this like weird like fountainy location, because if you look at the background, it actually, the background literally looks like what the dark fountains look like, at least like when you're about to close them, when you're close up to them. So I could go into how this whole thing ties into, you know, WD Gaster and his wacky shenanigans. But I'm not going to focus on that because, like I said, this is just a Chris video, so we're just going to focus on Chris and the soul, alright? The soul gets put into this possible device, I want to say, because it sounds like it is a device starting up from the start of the game. And then the strange voice asks us to create a vessel, obviously, for us to control since we're a new soul. Or a relatively new soul, I'll get to that eventually. At the end of the Ghana Maker sequence, as it's called, the vessel just gets discarded and we're told that our choices don't matter in this world. And then after, we're just put into Chris. It's never stated how long the sequence took place from chapter 1. It could be like years before, it could be days before, it could be literally right before chapter 1. Heck, I even saw someone say that it could be the end of Deltarune and it's like some sort of weird loop cycle, but this isn't theory territory, but either way. But it is implied that we've at least controlled Chris for some, for a good while at least. And if you don't really like believe me, I, I guess you could assume that we just controlled Chris at the start of chapter 1, but I think it's, we started like, I think technically in the lore of the game, we started controlling Chris before chapter 1, or at least a bit before. I say this because multiple times we are given a dialogue from characters talking about how Chris has been acting very strange lately. And usually you don't you don't say lately for like the first day. I say they've been saying like, oh you've been acting weird today. Not saying, you know, oh they've been acting strange lately. And also if you're questioning like why oh why didn't we have control before? Well, do you really want Toby Fox to make like I don't know Chapter Zero where they're just playing as Chris in a, like a high like a high school simulator game or something like that? I really don't think so. You'd be more interested in the total dark fountains and all that wacky stuff. But in my opinion, I think what this beginning scene is is some sort of machine that we the soul are put into by this mysterious voice, and we're basically like trying to create some sort of vessel. But we we somehow end up in Chris. Why Chris is actually? I don't know, it's weird that they would they were chosen as I mean they're the only human in hometown, so maybe there's something there. But I have theories on that which I will go into later when I actually explore more so with the whole thing about the bunker. Which uh stay tuned for that video. I'll hopefully try to get it out eventually. So even though we're controlling Chris during both chapters, for a majority of the time, there are times where we don't control Chris or Chris does their own thing and we actually find out they're like basically the true feelings. One of the earliest examples of this is actually in the opening cinematic of the game, where Toyo has Chris grab her hand, and Chris grabs it but looks very embarrassed while doing it. You might chalk that up to, oh, they're still touching their mother's hand and everything and still holding it, but it might also be because Susie is also looking. 
because apparently Susie references that afterwards, stepping back from the closet when it opens. Now this could tie into something in the future, but for right now, it is weird that Chris just steps back from it, even though when we go into that closet, Chris already has a save file in there. Chris protects Susie uncontrolled in chapter 1 to defend her against the king. There are several pieces of dialogue within the game that we can choose, but Chris can also choose how to say it. Sometimes they can come out as a confused sort of answer, sometimes they can come out as a yelling sense, but Chris has the ability to change how they want to speak or how they decide that that choice should be spoken as. Another interesting thing that not a lot of people really know about is the different tea flavors in Deltrune Chapter 2. Basically, when each character drinks it, they it shows sort of like their feelings towards each character. Uh, case in point, like Noelle, when she drinks Susie tea, it literally heals her up like 400%, so yeah. For Chris, it actually is very interesting. It shows that when Chris drinks Susie tea, they have very high feelings about Susie, which could be something... Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say a bit weird, but hmm, she, uh, Chris is going to need to watch out for Noel. just saying. When Chris drinks Noel tea, it, it, it basically Chris just has normal feelings for Noel. I'm guessing they're not really too good of friends anymore since they haven't hung out in a while, so... I'm guessing that's why it's sort of like, you know, medium. But strangely enough, when Chris drinks Rousey tea, it gives them the lowest amount of health. Which is like, huh, when you think about it, because Rousey looks like Asriel, maybe there's something there that Chris is sort of, you know, maybe mad or set, upset at. And the strangest thing of all in my opinion, which I said a bit earlier, but like, Chris doesn't move when they're in danger. Mo majority of the time, they don't. Like, for example, when they're being threatened, others are being threatened, and they're literally on the brink of death, they don't seem phased by it at all. Heck, one of the biggest scenes I'll point to this is the Spamton Neophyte scene. There, Chris just sits there waiting as Spamton starts getting closer and closer to take their soul. Which makes you think whether or not Chris actually wanted Spamton to do it or not. Like, think about it. They immediately moved in to save Susie from the king, but when Spamton tries to steal her soul, Chris just does nothing, and only gets up when Susie has to save them. It's pretty strange, but that honestly makes me wonder. I didn't want to bring this up, but a part of me sometimes feels that Chris might not be happy with themselves, or their life as a whole, but... I'll say, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not going to analyze that deep into it, but it's just something to think when thinking about this character, and I might mention it again later. Lastly, the most plot relevant part is that Chris takes out their soul so that we can see what they're doing half the time. This area of the video I now want to sector off into what I call the theory territory. Basically everything beforehand. I could believe is like 90% true. But now this is where all the theory crafting comes in. This might be controversial to some, but I do not think that we are literally Chris's soul. Again, throughout the game, we are told that Chris had their own life before the events of the game. So unless they lived it, literally being able to like barely move anywhere half the time, I don't think Chris just didn't have a soul before. Rather, imagine that we're attached to their soul, which is why when Chris rips it out, it almost seems like they are struggling, and it seems to cause them a lot of pain, considering that, you know, they're literally tearing their heart, or their soul, out of their chest. I've seen some people say that, oh, there might be a third entity, like, I don't know, a car to electric boogaloo. But I think that would sort of ruin the entire thing of Chris's dynamic, in personally, in my opinion. Because I want to say that Chris themselves is their own character and not some thing that's possessed by like three separate people. We have Undertale for that with all those theories and whatnot, but I feel like Chris in the player, it's very easy to discern which is which. And some people use the evidence of like the different walking patterns as Chris walks normally with the soul, but like walks weird without it. And I just want to point out that if you tore your soul out of your chest, would you be walking the same after that? Chris obviously wants to take us out and use their own body for their own, like, you know, pleasure and whatever, but 
like, here's the thing, if Chris liked what we were doing, then why in some dialogue choices they seem confused or yell out or do anything else? So I do think that Chris isn't friendly towards us, the player, because again, why would they want to tear us out half the time? This may be a spoiler for when I do my Who is the Knight theory eventually at the end of the series or like near the end of it as one of the last things. But I don't think for a second that Chris is quote unquote evil. Chris is definitely in their late teenager stage. So all Chris really wants is freedom. They're going to be a lot more resilient to the idea of someone else controlling them and are going to want to be free. You see freedom mentioned uh, twice by both secret bosses and I'll get to them eventually but... They mention it a lot in what, um, relation to Chris, or at least like Spamton does. I forget some of Jebel's lines right now, but Spamton does a lot, and I mean a lot, of referencing Chris. To the point where Chris actually gets like upset after the secret boss fight and everything. Now I could analyze a lot more about like the psychology of Chris, how they feel about their parents, the divorce, how they feel about Asriel being gone, all that stuff, but... I don't want this video to be too long and I'm sort of here to do like a short form type of thing about Chris's analysis. And I want to bring up one last point to end it off because this is also supposed to be a theory video as well. My final point for this video and basically the theory as a whole that I have for Chris's character in Deltrune is that I think the overall story of Deltrune will have a good ending. Even if it stays they only have one ending. But I think there will be some parts to that. What if that one ending is basically how the neutral ending is in Undertale? Where you can have the neutral ending, you still leave the underground, but there are a bunch of varieties to it. There are a bunch of different things that can happen. Imagine that but for Deltrune. It ends with you leaving Chris. You the soul leave Chris and leave them to just live out their life. It will be very touching to the story I feel if even after all this time controlling them, whether we made good or bad choices, we finally give them the freedom that they desperately want. Whether that be like willingly or unwillingly. It was still also lined up with Toby's original statements as well as it would be giving us our choices mattering at the end, whether you did like, again, a snow grave or a regular route or a pacifist route while also giving us that one ending he promised because that would just be one ending. It's just that there are varieties to the ending. I'm probably not the first person to think that there will be one ending, but that's where I feel like it is going to end, especially for Chris's story. I feel like Chris's story sort of has to end with them being able to get rid of us, or at least them being able to control their body again and themselves as a whole. But again, that's just a theory, a JK theory, yay, 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 um, I'm gonna miss Mad Pat. So then, let me ask you the question, who is Chris Dreamer? Well, to me, I feel like Chris is the best character in this game, bar none, honestly. There have been plenty of videos that analyze Chris, so I'm not gonna be the first original one, but Chris is a silent character that has their silence and their, like, actions speak louder than anything they could ever say. But Chris is ultimately at the end of the day a teenager who's struggling with controlling themselves because we're controlling th them literally. They also feel a bit abandoned probably due to the fact that Asriel's in college, Des is obviously missing, Noel they don't hang out with anymore, Toyo and Asgore are divorced, there's a lot of stuff going on in their life. Which honestly makes sense as to why maybe Chris has some sort of attachment to Susie, because Susie might be the next, the like, the most recent friend they've been able to make. And their sort of hatred, or not sort of hatred, but resentment towards Rousey might be because they look like Asriel, obviously. Chris, to me, might be one of the most tragic characters in this game. I'm not gonna say the most tragic yet, because we all know their full story yet, but they are definitely top three of the, the tragic characters in this game. And part of the reasoning I did Chris first is because you'll see in a lot of them that Chris is honestly linked to every single character in this game. Like, people usually make like a big chart where they have like Gaster in the middle and stuff like that, but honestly, I put Chris in the middle of that. They're the connection that ties nearly everything in Deltune together, and that's why they're so fascinating to me, and that's why I love this character so much. 
So hope you enjoy my analysis. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe. Tell me how I should go forward in approaching this sort of uh, sort of type of video style. And let me know your thoughts about Chris and why you might like them as a character and maybe some other theories you have about them and how the story went. But until next time, this has been the Deltarune Files.